My name's Adam, and today I'm recording this quick video to show you guys how to set up the Binance API and sync users transaction history. I'm going to be using Bubbles Visual Programming software to get this done, but if you're writing this in custom code, don't worry, because the process is going to be the exact same. So if you keep watching the video, I'll show you how to get this done quickly and easily. To show you what's actually possible, so this is what I've currently built. Um, ignore what's going on in the background, it's not fully built, but essentially this is what's possible. So you can sync transaction history. So as you can see, we've got dates and we've got all histories for trades um, and uh, from a user, we've got the holdings, so we can then display this however we want, um, and obviously the asset portfolio. So as I said before, it's not done, it looks a bit dodgy, but essentially all the data is here. And then we can go forward and put portfolio tracking features on, like calculating profit and loss, etc, etc. Okay, to get started, first things first is we need to make a call to Binance API and receive an actual response. So one thing I definitely recommend doing is downloading the Postman repository for Binance. Um, I'll put a link to this in the description and so you can practice sending some calls here. The other thing is you can also create testnet keys, testnet API keys, if you want to test with some API keys prior to using real keys. One thing I'll note with the test keys is that they don't work for a few of the calls, so just be aware of that. The other thing is that the URL for the testnet is obviously different, so here we can see testnet.binance.vision. The actual URL uh, does not include testnet, it's a bit different to this URL. Um, and these here are testnet keys. So what we can then do is make a call and we can see that the two main parameters are the timestamp parameter and the signature parameter. The timestamp parameter is essentially the number of milliseconds since the 1st of January 1970 and the signature parameter is essentially a query URL and the user's secret key concatenated and HMAC encrypted. Um, and that might sound a bit confusing. So I'll show you what it looks like in this plugin. So using the crypto JS module, um, we just do, we can encrypt the concatenated query and the secret key. Um, if you're using bubble to do this, uh, there's a Binance API bundle plugin, which I built that's available. Um, and that will handle this for you. If not, it is possible using the concatenated query for the API call and the secret key, but that is quite difficult to get in uh, the bubble interface. If you're custom coding, um, then you then I'd recommend downloading the crypto JS module and using this function to concatenate the signature. So um, before I quickly delve into the nitty and gritty, uh, it is complex. Um, so you'll find myself repeating myself a fair bit here, but I'm just going to try and do my best to explain everything that's going on here. So first things first, when a user clicks a sync history button, I've got a trigger a workflow. Um, which will schedule this backend workflow that runs on the server. Um, so this API workflow is the, the first workflow to get called. Um, and so what I do here is, first thing I do is I hit the fiat deposit withdraw endpoints. Um, and the reason for that is that I then store all of the currencies that the user has deposited or withdrawn, withdrawn and I consider these fiat currencies. Um, and essentially what that means is, let's just say someone's put in AUD and they withdrawn in USD, I'll consider those two currencies fiat. So if they trade euros or some other currency, I'm going to consider that as an investment and not as a fiat currency. That's my personal choice for this app. Um, you don't have to do that, but that's essentially what I'm doing in this step. Um, and the reason I'm doing that, sorry, just to provide reasoning on that, is that when you go into here, um, I'm going to define a sell or a buy, as you'll see when people are using AUDs. So for me, I'm just using AUD because I'm an Australian developer. This is for an Australian market. Um, so anytime someone sells or converts to AUD, I'm classifying that as a sell. And anytime when someone converts AUD to a cryptocurrency or another asset, I'm classifying that as a buy. So that's why I'm doing that. Next up, I'm going to hit the Binance Exchange Information Endpoint. Um, and what I'm getting back from that is a list of all of the crypto coins that are currently offered on Binance. And then I can, what I'm going to do with that is iterate through every single symbol pair, um, which you'll see. So that through, I'm going to put that through the, where is it? The account trade list endpoint, um, which essentially gets the trades for a specific symbol. Um, so I'm going to hit every single symbol pair and get a response. And that's how you do it with the Binance API. Um, it is slow and it's painful. 
uh, but it's the only way to do it um, that I know of. If you know a better way, let me know. Um, yeah, so that's basically how that works. Uh, if that's enough for you, feel free to go off and do it on yourself. I'm now going to go into a bit more depth about how I classify each of these, um, how I've set it up so that you get this nice display about trade, sell, um, and stuff like that. But essentially, the basics are we hit the exchange information, we get all the symbol pairs, then we iterate through every single symbol pair through the account trade list to get the history. Another thing I'll quickly note, this is an important one, is not all trades are under the spot endpoint. Um, what I found out later after talking to Binance Support is that the convert endpoint, um, some trades are hidden in the convert endpoint if you've converted a crypto to another crypto. So another workflow I've got going on here, which is the final one, is to hit this conversion endpoint. You'll find it down here. Convert trade history. Um, and that's that's a similar process. You also have to iterate through that. Um, so with that, that'll actually return more than one trade, um, but it'll only return, as you can see here, max interval has to be 30 days. So depending on how far back you want to go, I think I'm two years, um, you'll have to set up a little loop to get the past 30 days and get the 30 days before that and the 30 days before that, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, for however far back you want to go. Okay, so now to look at both the convert endpoint and the spot endpoint a little bit deeper, we can get into that. Um, and I will note there are a bunch of other endpoints. I mean, if you're looking to get crypto loan endpoints i don't even know what some of these are uh, but if you're looking at if you are missing some data in your loop and you're wondering where it could be it could be in some of these endpoints in ft endpoints rebate rebate endpoints i just want to let you guys know that those endpoints are there i'm not choosing to use them but you might want to use them anyway um okay so back to here uh so first orange you'll see is the convert endpoint purple is the spot endpoint so we'll look at the convert first it's a little bit easier um essentially we hit the convert endpoint then what i do is i schedule this workflow which loops through so this one will be run on every single transaction um and what i do is that these three steps here um this is some javascript just to determine whether a fiat is present in the uh the conversion um and then what i do is i either classify it as a sell, a trade, um, or a buy. Sorry, I was wondering where that buy was. Sorry, as a buy, a sell, or a trade. And then this schedule is essentially to do the loop for the next one. So that's what this count parameter is here, plus one. So I send a list, I send a count, and then I just iterate through. Um, that's essentially how the conversion endpoint works. Um, okay, so with the trades, the Binance trades, um, what I do is I then... Uh, the reason why I have a JavaScript module here to check if USD is present, um, this is the script here. Um, the reason that is, is because every single crypto uh, has a USDT pair. So if you're going to, for me, I'm looking to convert everything to uh, the price of every conversion, including conversions that don't include AUD. Um, I want to convert everything to AUD. So what I do is I convert it to the USD pair. If US, if AUD isn't present, um, if AUD or USDT isn't present, um, what I'll do is I'll first convert the the price to USDT and then to AUD because I know USDT exists for every crypto token and AUD USDT exists. Um, that's the thought process behind that. Um, so what I do is I check if all of those things are present. Then what I do is I then schedule the this workflow. Similar to the conversion endpoint, what it, this does is, is essentially, um, so here what I'll do, let's just say the symbol that I've hit is AUD Bitcoin. Um, I'm assuming that's a symbol. Uh, so let's just say it's USD, USD Bitcoin. Yeah, okay, so USDT BTC is what the symbol would look like. Um, we go into here. Uh, we run a bunch of service scripts just to, these scripts for me are just to check. Um, so I run these checks, these scripts to check what the quote and base asset is. Um, and then from here, so I've got a bunch of different, uh, so it looks like there's 12 or 13 steps essentially to categorize. So B is a buy. So these are buys. 
Um, and why I have separate ones is if AUD is present, I want to store that AUD price. I don't want to run a workflow to convert it to USDT and then back to AUD. So if AUD is already present in the conversion, then, I, then I'm fine. That's good to go. Um, so as you can see, AUD is true. If AUD is false, then I want to run something else. Um, and if USDT, so if USDT is true, then I just need to run AUD to USDT. That's it. And then if neither USDT or AUD is present, then I need to run first every, I need to convert everything to USDT and then to AUD. So that's why there's three kind of steps there. Similarly, I've got the same thing going for trade. So that's what the T symbol stands for. And then the same thing going for, I've actually got four going for trade and then same thing for sell. Um, that's the basic logic behind that. Um, that's about everything. Again, I'm just going to reiterate, if you are a bubble user or you do want to look into these steps a little bit more, um, feel free to visit the Binance demo um, page that I've got. This is all public. Um, so I've put all this up on uh, bubble publicly. Just one important note I wanted to mention um, before I wrap the video up is the, uh, the API call waiting. So essentially what happens is Binance have put a rate limit on the API calls that you can make within a minute. Um, and that's if they, if you do more than that, you supposedly get uh, like banned for a day or you get kicked out for a certain time period. Um, I'm not sure the exact like rules around that, but essentially you can't make more than what's known as 1200 waiting of a call per minute. Um, as far as I'm aware. So for me, I've set the time limits. As you'll see, when I schedule a workflow, I add a few seconds between each iteration to make sure that I'm not spamming that endpoint. And what that means is that this, uh, this process does take upwards of half an hour at least. It obviously depends on um, how many kind of trades uh, the user has used, but essentially it's not a quick process. And you'll find that that's for all platforms that offer Binance transaction uh, syncing. So like, platforms like Coinly is a big one. I'm sure there's many big ones on, out there. There is essentially no instant way to do this, which is why I store all the data in the back end. Oops, I accidentally closed that. Um, so I store, sorry, in the database, sorry. So I store all the data in the database, the reason being because obviously this is a slow process. Um, so you want to set your application up in a way that this doesn't happen every two milliseconds. Um, that's up to you, but I just wanted to make you guys aware that uh, you do want to add some timing in between each API call. If you are someone who's watched this video and you've got some kind of direct maths behind how to set these API calls up and the uh, the rates at which you should be hitting each of these endpoints, please let me know down in the comments because I'm sure you're going to help me and a lot of other people out. Um, as well as that, so just to wrap up the video now, as well as that, any questions, anything that you think I've missed in this video, let me know down in the comments. Um, I'm definitely keen to make more videos on similar content. So if you're a bubbler, uh, someone that uses bubble, that's probably what I'll be focusing on. But if you're also someone in that kind of uh, personal finance crypto space, um, I'm also in that, in that area as well. So yeah, cheers for watching. I hope it was helpful. Leave a like and subscribe if it was helpful um, and leave a comment as well. Just letting me know that you found it useful. Um, yeah. Thanks.